Hello everybody, and welcome to today's Dynamic 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is account, uh, Inventory Accounting Setup in Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management. My name is AJ and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this session through Teams Live Events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and or phone number may be viewable by other session participants in the attendee list. By joining, you're agreeing to this experience. The recording will be available on TikTok's Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions and chat during the Q&A segment near the end. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Ann Krupke and Rachel Prophet. Both are senior fast track solution architects. Without further delay, Rachel, over to you. Thanks, AJ, and thank you everyone for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be joining from. Ann and I are so pumped up for this six amazing hours of tech talks in this brand new series all around inventory costing for Dynamics 365 supply chain management. In this first part, we're going to be diving into inventory accounting setup. But first, let's do some quick introductions. We'll start with Anne. Anne, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Rachel. I'm Anne. I'm a senior fast track solution architect on the SCM team here at Microsoft. I am so excited to be here today and to get to talk to the community about inventory costing. And I'm looking forward to the feedback that we get from our customer and partner community about how we can make sure implementations are successful. Awesome, thanks, Anne. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rachel Prophet. I'm also a Fast Track Solution Architect. My contact information is here on the screen and I encourage you to follow me on Twitter, check out my YouTube channel at Dynamics 365 Unboxed, connect with me on LinkedIn, or check out my blog at dynamics365lady.com. With that, we're gonna dive in and take a quick look at what our series includes. This is the first Tech Talk in a series of six Tech Talks that will dive into the details of inventory costing in Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management. In this first Tech Talk, we'll be focusing on key setups and configurations that control and change the behavior of costing. In our second Tech Talk, we'll dive into details and examples of each costing methodology with the exception of standard costing, which will have its own tech talk where we'll also cover the costing sheet. We continue to build on the costing logic in part four by diving into production costing. And then in part five, we will review the inventory closing and adjustment process and we'll wrap up the series with the new global inventory accounting add-in. So we have a riddle for you and we invite you to write your answers into the Q&A panel. This is just for fun because why not? Uh, we like to keep our uh, tech talks engaging. Uh, so we invite you to type your answers into the Q&A panel and we're gonna reveal the answer at the very end. The riddle is what kind of betting does an accountant have? That's right, what kind of betting does an accountant have? Go ahead and type those answers into the Q&A panel and we'll get those published out and we'll reveal the answer at the very end. So let's take a quick look at the agenda for today's Tech Talk. We'll start with some basic inventory costing concepts and terminology. Then we will review the details and options available on the item model groups, which are a key configuration to control how costing will work in Dynamics 365. Then we'll walk through the settings available on storage and tracking dimension groups that affect costing. We'll wrap it up with some best practices and do's and don'ts, as well as some additional resources you can learn to uh, use to learn more about costing. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Anne to introduce us to some basic costing concepts. Thanks, Rachel. We're gonna start by talking about some common terminology that we will use in this Tech Talk and, and in the other Tech Talks in this series that'll help us understand the core foundation of costing. First, let's talk about why is costing important? Costing impacts many aspects of any business. The cost of items directly impacts your profit and loss statement. It also drives the value of your inventory, which is reported in your balance sheet as well. 
Higher cost items can lead to losses or slim margins if you don't have the proper visibility to set a valid sales price. If it costs you more to make or buy an item than you are selling an item for, then you'll take a loss. Margins can vary vastly from industry to industry and market to market, but in order to calculate the margin, you will need to accurately report on the cost of your items. The configurations that we set up in the system will determine how we track the cost to procure or produce inventory and how that cost is applied to our sales. At the core of it, there are only two ways for a business to increase profits on existing products and services. One is by reducing costs, and two is by increasing prices. Therefore, accurately capturing costs is critical to be able to set appropriate prices and identify areas where costs can be reduced. Let's look at a basic inventory distribution flow. We start by creating a purchase order. A purchase price is typically defined for each item on our purchase order. Unless you are following encumbrance accounting rules, the PO creation process typically does not have an impact on the value of your inventory or ledger. Next, you will receive the goods into your inventory. In most organizations and under generally accepted accounting practices, the value of inventory should be accrued for in your accounting system when you take possession of the goods. This creates a liability that you owe the supplier money and increases the value of your assets on the balance sheet. The cost that is used is typically the purchase price of those goods. Later, when you receive an invoice from the supplier for the goods, you will generate an invoice on the purchase order. The invoice records the final cost for the goods, and at this point, you update your financial systems to indicate that the inventory value is moved into the cost of goods purchase bucket. The values will remain physically and financially in your possession until you sell the items. So let's assume a customer places a sales order to buy items that you have on hand in your inventory. Most organizations use a system to track the requirements around the request to purchase the goods. Once you've completed any required packaging or quality checks, you'll ship the goods. At this point, documents are typically generated to indicate what items are being shipped. This might include a packing slip, bill of lading, or even a commercial invoice, for example, when you need to ship something internationally. Once you ship the goods, under generally accepted accounting practices, most organizations will accrue for the loss of inventory in a shipped, not invoiced account. Finally, you'll invoice your customer. In some cases, organizations may combine the shipping and invoicing process into one logical step, but it may also be recorded in the system as two different steps. The invoice records the cost of the items and draws down the inventory balance and increases the customer balance for the cash that is owed to your organization. The cost that is used on the sale is important as it affects how margins are calculated. Let's break this process further down into its core components. When we are looking at the transactions that post in the system to determine what our costs are, we have a few terms that we will use throughout this Tech Talk series that also crop up in Microsoft documentation on costing features. First, we have what we call source documents, which are the vehicles for creating and updating the transactions that we process in our system. Some examples of source documents are shown here, purchase order, sales order, and inventory adjustment journal. Within a source document, we can track information about one or more source document lines. A source document line tracks the details of the related transaction, such as item quantity and price. For example, we can have three different lines on our purchase order for three different items as we see here. Product dimensions such as size, color, style, and configuration will always have a separate source document line while the same source document line could relate to multiple storage and tracking dimensions. Source document lines are then related to one or more inventory transactions, also referred to as source transactions. The system will automatically create one source transaction for each unique combination of inventory dimensions related to the source document line. In this example, we get three source transactions related to our purchase order line since we will have three serial numbers that we receive against it. Often, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between source document lines and source transactions in cases where the product is shipped or received in a single warehouse and no tracking dimensions are used. We will also touch on later how sometimes updates to source document lines can cause additional source transactions to be created. 
In costing terminology, it is important to understand the concept of issues and receipts. Every inventory transaction is classified as one or the other. A receipt is any transaction that increases our on-hand inventory, and an issue is any transaction that decreases our on-hand inventory. The cost of our receipts, or our inflow cost, is typically predefined. For example, think of purchase prices. While the cost of our issue, issue transactions is one of the questions we need to answer with our costing configuration. How do we assign the cost of our receipts to determine the cost of our various issue transactions? During the processing of issue and receipt transactions, there are multiple updates applied and different statuses that the transactions can have. Let's return to our basic process flow to look at the various transaction status updates. Looking at that flow, First, let's split our process into the receipt and issue transactions. The purchase order is a receipt since it's increasing our inventory, and the sales order is an issue since it's decreasing our inventory. The different steps in the process for each of these source transactions have some further classifications. They're classified as physical and financial updates. A physical update to a transaction has an impact, positive or negative, to the on-hand inventory quantity while a financial update to a transaction occurs when we are recording the cost of the transaction to the general ledger. In this example, both the purchase receipt of goods, also known as a product receipt, and the sales order shipment of goods, also known as a packing slip, are physical transaction updates. The product receipt increases our on-hand inventory, and the packing slip decreases our on-hand inventory. Transactions that are physically updated but not financially updated are considered still open and can have corrections or updates applied. For both the purchase and sales orders, the invoice posting will be our financial update. If we recall from the earlier slide, when we post the invoice on the purchase, we will move the purchase cost from the receive not invoice bucket and put it into the cost of goods purchased. And for the sales order, we will move the issue cost from ship not invoiced into the cost of goods sold. Once an invoice has been posted, the source transaction is considered closed from any further updates or postings. It is important to note though, that the final cost of the transaction may still be adjusted based on the way we configure costing in the system. But at this point in the process, the source document line is considered finalized. <laughs> The receipt and issue transactions are assigned different statuses in the system as they're updated. On this slide, we can see what the different statuses are for each type of transaction, with the statuses on the top being the earlier and progressing through the transaction lifecycle as we go down the list. Some of these statuses are not required by the system and can be skipped if not relevant to the business process. For example, you could use the product registration function on a purchase order transaction to record inventory into the system before a product receipt occurs. Some businesses who used advanced warehousing will register the inventory into the warehouse via the mobile application and then process the full details of a product receipt in a second step. In other cases, the physical and financial update may occur at the same time. For example, when an inventory adjustment journal is posted, the physical and financial updates happen in the same step, so we will not see the physical status, just the financial status when the journal is posted. When we look at the process flow again, we can see what the status would be for each step in our process. Our purchase order receipt status starts as ordered, is updated to received when we post the product receipt, and is once again updated to purchased when we post the invoice. On the sales order issue status, we start with on order status, update to deducted when we post the packing slip, and update again to sold when the invoice is posted. If, for example, we had a multiple quantity of inventory on our purchase order line and only received it partially, then we would get a second source transaction generated to reflect the quantity that remains in the ordered status. The original source transaction would be updated to the received status with the quantity that was received. This concept applies to any time we have a partial update on any source transaction. Likewise, if you register 10 serial numbers at the point of receipt on a purchase order, the initial single source transaction will be split into 10 separate transactions because each one now has a unique inventory dimension combination. 
This next slide can be used as a reference to help understand different types of updates that occur to transactions. The first column indicates the type of transaction update. The second column indicates the source transaction that is being updated. The third column states whether the source transaction is classified as an issue or a receipt. And the fourth column denotes whether the update is physical or financial. You'll notice that, for example, production order ending is marked as both issue and a receipt update in this case. There are many inventory transaction updates that happen during the production ending process. All the items that were consumed during the production order are physically updated issues, and the finished good that is produced is a physically updated receipt. Those issue and receipt transactions related to a production order are financially closed by the production order ending process all at the same time. Transfer orders are a little special in that there are two updates, but there are actually three total inventory transactions behind the scenes. The additional transaction is used to keep track of the inventory in the transit warehouse between the point of shipment and receipt. The additional transaction is physically updated during shipment and financially updated during the transfer order receipt. Journal transactions are slightly different from the previous examples discussed for a couple of reasons. Firstly, journals do not have a, a two-step update process where the physical and financial updates are posted separately. As we mentioned in an earlier slide, journal posting will create both the physical and financial updates at the same time. Additionally, some journals can be for issues, receipts, or include both types of transactions. For example, a transfer journal would generate two transactions, an issue transaction to remove the inventory from the starting location and a receipt transaction to add the inventory into the target location. As another example, an inventory adjustment journal could either be a receipt to add an inventory, an issue to count out inventory, or both if we have multiple lines. This slide and the previous do not encompass the full set of transactions that can occur in D365 supply chain management, but they serve as examples of commonly used transactions and how the updates are classified in the system. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel to talk about item model groups. Thanks, Anne. Now that we have a basic understanding of terminology and costing concepts, Let's talk about the configuration that controls how costing will work, starting with the item model group. Item model groups are the fundamental configuration that control the costing and behavior of an item when you post transactions. There's no limit to the number of item groups that you can configure, but you should carefully plan your business scenarios and only create the number of item model groups that are needed for your situation. Using multiple item model groups provides you the flexibility so that all items do not need to use the same policies. At a high level, the policies in an item model group include, but are not limited to each of the following. First is the inventory policy, which defines if an item is stocked or not stocked. In other words, should the system create inventory transactions or is the item expensed? Next, we have the inventory model. This is the costing methodology that you'll use for the items, such as FIFO, first in, first out, LIFO, last in, first out, weighted average, standard cost, and so on. Next, we have the include physical value option, which is an important option that controls if the value of transactions that are physically updated will be included in the cost calculation. The next option we have is the fixed receipt price. This is another option that you may be familiar with if you use standard costing in AX 2009 or prior. This is a sort of, quote, lightweight standard costing that uses the fixed receipt prices, but still allows for a perpetual costing model. A variety of ledger options, such as post physical inventory and post financial inventory, indicate if the item will create vouchers at time of physical or financial update. Some options are disabled when you do not select the stock product flag on the item model group. There are also a variety of flags that control whether physical or financial inventory is allowed. 
In addition to the flags and policies that have an effect on the costing of items, there are many flags that control the logistical or operational aspects of your items. We will not be focusing on these options in this series. Now that we have a basic understanding of the item model groups, let's talk about a few of these settings in more detail. Let's start first with the inventory models. One of the primary functions of the item model group is to determine the inventory model that will be used for items that are assigned to the item model group. Sometimes these are referred to as costing methodologies as they control how the items will be costed. The models can be split into two categories. Periodic, which includes FIFO, first in, first out, LIFO, last in, first out, LIFO date, weighted average, and weighted average date. Periodic costing methods always use a running average throughout the period. The periodic cost is only updated to the costing model selected when you run an inventory close. While there are two perpetual models called moving average and standard costing. These costing models do not use the running average when posting transactions in re real time. We will be taking a much closer look at these in part two and three of the inventory costing tech talk series, but for now, let's just keep it with a high level overview. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit more about selecting your item model group and the impact of changing your item model groups. It is critical to determine what your inventory models will be at the onset of your project and to assign them appropriately to your items. In most cases, you cannot change the item model group. When changing your inventory costing model, it is strongly recommended to consult with a certified accountant in your region. There may be tax and audit implications to making a change. This includes changes that you are making from a legacy system to a new Dynamics 365 system as well. While there is a mechanism built into the system to change from any costing model to the standard costing model, all other changes are not supported after transactions exist in the system. There is a process that can be used to update the item model group to a new model group, but this process can be complicated, time consuming, and costly. And it's important to note that there is no automated way to process the change. We'll take a closer look at that process, the standard costing conversion process in part three of this Tech Talk series. Keep in mind that if you change costing methods, you may not have the historical data that is needed to create accurate costing layers for your methodology. For example, if you want to change from standard costing to FIFO costing, all historical transactions are valued at a standard cost rather than the FIFO methodology. You may need to import on-hand inventory with different dates and different cost prices in this example to create the original layers of a first-in, first-out, or FIFO cost price. This can be time-consuming and difficult to do and should be done with extreme caution. If you do have the need to change your inventory model from one periodic type to another periodic type after transactions exist, there's a strict process you should use. First, you'll need to count the inventory down to zero. You'll need to temporarily remove any existing reservations, registrations, and so on that might exist for your transactions. Second, you'll need to perform an inventory close. This is done in the closing and adjustment form found in the periodic area of inventory management. Next, you'll need to set the session date to a date that is after the last closing. You won't be able to make this change unless that current session date is set to after the closing. Then you'll need to, after you've performed that inventory close, you can change the storage dimension group on the released item level. After you've changed that item model group on the items, then you can start to bring your inventory back in, adding your reservations, registrations, and so on that you removed in step one. We always recommend that you test this process in a test environment prior to conducting in a production environment and that this process is completed during a downtime at period close. So let's take a closer look at the periodic inventory models and some basic principles that are followed when you use the periodic costing methods. 
First, it's important to understand that issued transactions are posted with the running average cost of on-hand inventory at the point in time the transaction is posted. Next, you can run the inventory recalculations to adjust posted transactions to reflect the cost model heuristic based on the date you run the recalculation. When you use a periodic costing method, the inventory closing is used to finalize adjustments and create settlements according to the model principles. You can also use marking to override the heuristic cost and apply an actual cost, so to speak, to an issue transaction when you use any periodic inventory model. On the contrary, when you use perpetual inventory models, some of the basic principles are different. For starters, transactions post at a cost base on the cost model type, and it does not get adjusted. While the inventory close does not make any adjustments, we do still recommend that you run the inventory close for all inventory models as it prevents the backdating of transactions. With perpetual inventory, discrepancies, also known as variances, between the posted cost and actual cost are posted to a designated account. And unlike periodic models, marking does not affect the cost of any transactions when you use perpetual costing methods. We'll talk more in detail about each costing method in part two and part three of the Tech Talk series, so we hope you'll register and join us for those. Now, we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about the include physical value option and some other options. You will need to consider which costing model you're using. Noting that the include physical value option can only be used with periodic inventory models. In other words, you cannot use the option with standard cost or moving, moving average. When you are deciding whether to use the include physical value checkbox, there are several important questions and considerations depending on your country or region. There may be regulations that prevent you from using the physical value. You'll want to decide whether to include uninvoiced receipts in the running cost calculations that are used for issues in real time. When you typically have large swings between receipt and invoice, this may create an undesired swing in costs on your sales, for example, which may lead to confusion from your sales team, especially in an organization that provides commission based commissions based on the cost. Lastly, it's important to note an and understand that the include physical value option only affects the real-time running average of your transactions. Once transactions are financially updated and the inventory is closed, the costing model selected will be applied. The next setting that we're going to take a look at is the fixed receipt price option. Fixed receipt price is an option you can select on an item model group when you use an inventory model other than standard cost or moving weighted average. This option was referred to as standard cost in early versions of Dynamics AX and was renamed to fixed receipt price in Dynamics AX 2012 when the new standard cost inventory model was introduced. Because this option is used in conjunction with different inventory models such as FIFO, LIFO, or weighted average, the inventory close and adjustment process will still create settlements and adjustments according to the inventory principle that you select. However, adjustments are only made to issues from inventory. When you select the fixed receipt price option, the system will use a receipt price as a standard cost for any inventory receipts, such as on a purchase order. If there's a difference between the purchase price and the default item cost, configured for a product, the difference will be posted to the fixed receipt price profit or fixed receipt price loss account, and the offset will get posted to the fixed receipt price offset account that you specify on the inventory posting profile page. This option is typically only used in scenarios where the purchase prices for an item do not vary significantly from order to order. It's also important to note that this costing methodology should not be used as a replacement for standard costing. 
Now, let's talk about stocked versus not stocked products. Stocked products are handled in inventory and generate inventory transactions, while stocked products do not. Next, it's important to note that stocked products can be included in cost calculations. Finished good or WIP stock products can include both items and services. However, a service cannot be added to a stock. While Dynamics 365 requires that a pro forma stock transaction is generated for um, services that contribute to the inventory value of tangible goods. For example, pro forma stock transactions must be generated if a service is used to subcontract production steps. Next, it's important to note that on-hand quantities can also be maintained for stocked products, but not for not stocked products. Lastly, I want to note that the general ledger postings for stocked and not stocked products are different. Stocked products are typically posted to an asset account in the balance sheet on the general ledger, while not stocked items are expensed to the profit and loss statements. So, Let's look at an example of negative physical inventory next. Let's assume the negative physical inventory option is set to no on both the item model group and the warehouse. The storage dimension group is configured to have the site dimension active and the physical inventory checkbox is selected. Then you create a PO for a quantity of 10. Let's say the items have arrived at your warehouse physically, but the product is not yet received and uh, posted in the system. A sales order exists in the system that needs to consume the items that have arrived at your warehouse. When you attempt to post the packing slip for the sales order, there's not enough inventory available in your warehouse for the item and the posting is canceled. If you post the product receipt for the purchase order and then re-attempt to post the sales order packing slip, the posting will succeed and you will have nine physically on hand. In general, we do not recommend that you allow your inventory to go physically negative, unless there's a strong business reason to do so. Obviously, your inventory cannot actually go physically negative, meaning that you consume more than you have. In some cases, due to business processes or integrations, it may be necessary to allow the inventory to go negative to prevent the warehouse from stopping operations. And if you do allow physical negative inventory, you should have a clear process in place to regularly check and correct negative inventory. Now, let's take a look at an example of financial negative inventory. In this example, we will assume that you do not allow physical or financial negative inventory. Assuming you have received a quantity of 10 on a purchase order again for a specific item, but the invoice is not yet posted. 10 are physically available in inventory, but zero are financially available. Next, you create a sales order and ship it for a quantity of one. So at this point, you have nine physically in inventory and zero are financially in inventory. Later, you try to post the sales order invoice. An error will be received that financial negative inventory is not allowed. In this example, you would need to invoice the purchase order first to update the sales orders. In most organizations, this is not possible until you have the physical invoice from the vendor, and therefore it's generally recommended to leave the financial negative inventory checkbox selected on the item model group. If you have a make to order sales process and the costs are critical to the sales, for example, you may consider clearing this checkbox. Once you repost the sales order invoice again, it will be successful. At this point, you will have nine financially available in inventory. Again, in general, we do not, or we do suggest rather, that you allow your inventory to go financially negative, unless there is a strong business reason not to allow it. Preventing financial negative inventory can have impact on your ability to invoice your sales orders and could have a negative impact on your cash flow forecasting, for example, not to mention your operations. If your business uses a make to order process and the final purchase prices are critical to establishing your sales prices, you may want to consider preventing negative financial inventory. Now I'm going to hand it back over to Anne to talk about dimension groups. Thanks, Rachel. 
In this section, we'll talk about the three types of dimension groups in Dynamics 365, product dimension groups, storage dimension groups, and tracking dimension groups. Let's take a closer look at the relationship each type of dimension group has with costing. In this pair of screenshots, we are looking at an examples of a storage dimension group and a tracking dimension group. There are some decisions that we need to make when configuring these groups which will drive costing. First, the active checkbox on the storage and tracking dimensions tells us which of the listed options will be available for use in a source document for any items in those groups. In this example, the site, warehouse, and location are our active storage dimensions and the batch and serial numbers are our are our active tracking dimensions. Once we know what our active dimensions will be, we need to look at a couple more things. Next, we need to decide whether we will track physical inventory at each active dimension, which is controlled by the physical inventory checkbox. This means that we will post physical updates to our source transactions using the dimensions that are tracking physical inventory. This also means that transactions that are generated to track physical movements of inventory are included in the cost calculation if we have also selected that we will include physical value on the item model group, which we mentioned in the previous section. It's important to note that the active checkbox and the physical inventory checkbox are most often used together, where one is set to yes, the other is also. One major exception to this trend is the owner dimension, which will always have physical inventory equal to yes, even if it's not active. As long as it's not active, the owner dimension will not be required to post on any transactions. The site dimension will always have physical inventory turn on, but for all other dimensions, it is a business decision whether or not to activate. The final configuration to address is the financial inventory checkbox. If this checkbox is selected for a given dimension, then it indicates that we will track our costs on that dimension. For example, if I set the financial inventory value to yes on the warehouse, then we would track costs for each warehouse separately. Similarly, if we enabled financial inventory on the serial number, we would track costs by each individual serial number. The site dimension will always have financial inventory turned on, but for all other dimensions, it is a business decision which to activate. It's important to note that the available inventory value reports will only show cost on the dimensions that are enabled for financial inventory. In general, the more dimensions at which you track inventory, the more complex your cost calculations will be and the more difficult they can be to understand. But in some cases, it certainly makes sense to enable on more than just the site level. Once you set up your storage and tracking dimension groups, it is not possible to edit them. Uh, to edit the active physical inventory or financial inventory settings within the existing groups. It is possible to change the storage or tracking dimension group that is used on an item. You can follow the same process that Rachel described for changing item model groups in an earlier section. However, the system will not allow you to change to a new dimension group if it doesn't have the same uh, dimensions that are tracking financial inventory. This is why it's really important to decide whether we're going to track financial inventory, particularly on the warehouse level, before we go live. Because if I enable it only on the site level, and then I decide after transactions have occurred that I want to enable it on the warehouse level, the only way to achieve this from the user interface is to create a new set of items and get rid of all my inventory with my old items and load them as new, which is, is certainly not ideal for an implementation. So it's, it's really important to investigate the pros and cons of enabling financial inventory on more than just the site level prior to go live because it's not something that we can change afterwards. Mm -hmm. Product dimensions like size, color, style, configuration, and version allow us to tell, sell multiple options of the same base product. These options are called product variants in D365. Product dimension groups are different from storage and tracking dimension groups in that any active product dimension in the group is always tracked for physical inventory, and we do not have the option to enable financial inventory on, on each of the product dimensions. We do, however, have a decision to make on the release product configuration 
whether we want to have a different cost price for each variant. The use cost price by variant flag on the released product drives whether we will have a single cost for all variants or a cost for each one. Let's start. Let's review an example of what it looks like when we only have financial inventory enabled on the site level, but we have physical inventory enabled on the warehouse level. For simplicity's sake, let's assume that all the receipts shown in the table on the left are posted on the same day and that they are all financially updated. We have three different warehouses in the same site, which can be identified by their colors. Warehouse one is blue, warehouse two is yellow, and warehouse three is in red. The next day, we have a number of issues from inventory that are also financially updated, which are shown in this table on the right. Because the warehouse dimension is enabled for physical inventory, we can see which warehouses we are receiving and shipping inventory in, and we can ensure that we do not allow the system to go physically negative on the warehouse level. Let's assume we're using an average cost method to value the issue transaction. As you can see, since we only enabled financial inventory on the site level and not on the warehouse level, we will get the same price assigned to all of the issue transactions in this site, regardless of which warehouse the inventory was shipped out of. The cost is calculated as the overall average for the entire site. Now let's look at the same example, but see what would change if we enable financial inventory on the warehouse level as well as the site level. We've got the same transaction set for our receipts from the previous slide coming into our three different warehouses. Once again, we have the same set of issue transactions, but this time we have a different average cost calculated for each of our three warehouses based on the average of the receipts for each warehouse individually. This is because we enabled our financial inventory on the warehouse level. Let's think about the downstream impact of having different costs for each warehouse versus the same cost. One thing to think about would be margins. If I have a business where I set sales prices on a global level and I procure and distribute inventory through a centrally managed process, but I track costs individually by warehouse, my margins could be very different from warehouse to warehouse. Does it make sense to judge the warehouse's margin as an indicator of performance if I'm not allowing them to either set their own sales prices or attempt to reduce the cost of material to create a more desirable margin? In the next couple of slides, we will take this concept of tracking financial inventory at different levels and examine how we might apply it in some common industry scenarios. Mm -hmm. In the retail industry, it is very common that a form of average costing is used since it is assumed that inventory is issued at random from the existing stock instead of following strict FIFO or LIFO fulfillment models. It is also common that each retail store is modeled as its own warehouse in Dynamics 365, with a single site grouping them together. When implementing costing in D365, we want to think about whether each store requires its own unique cost price or whether we should use the same cost for every store. When stores are modeled as warehouses, we would have to consider whether to enable financial inventory on the warehouse level. In a simple retail model, it may not be necessary to track different prices by stores if the stores are being fulfilled by a centralized planning department and are not in charge of managing their own costs or sales prices. In another example, we could have a multi-country model we might want to have all stores in the same country have the same cost price, but have different costs for each country. We could, in this case, create one site for each country and assign the stores from that country to the corresponding site. In that case, we would only need to enable financial inventory on the site level, but would still be able to view costs separately by country. We may also require different legal entities for each country. And in that case, we could have one site per entity and achieve the same result. Let's consider another example of a franchisee model. In this case, specific stores are owned by third parties instead of the main company. For this reason, we may want to have a different cost by store for each of the franchisees. To achieve this, we have two options. We could either enable financial inventory on the warehouse level and have all stores again under a single site, or we could set up one site for each store warehouse and enable financial inventory only at the site level. 
As another example, many manufacturing organizations require more accurate or actual base costing. That is especially true in make to order scenarios. In many process manufacturing environments, traceability is also critical. There are a couple of different configurations that might make sense in this case. Let's look at a scenario where the manufacturer needs to know which batches have been sold on each source transaction. In this case, they would certainly want to enable physical inventory on the batch number in the tracking dimension group so that the system knows that it needs to be recorded on all transactions. If the manufacturer wants to track cost as close to actuals as possible, but still wants to keep it simple, they can use a LIFO or a FIFO inventory cost model based on which most closely matches their processes. In another scenario, assuming LIFO or FIFO processes may not be specific enough when it comes to costing. If we have the requirement to track costs on a batch or serial level, then we could either enable financial inventory on the batch and or serial dimensions in the tracking group, or to use the inventory marking functionality, which we'll cover in the next Tech Talk. By enabling financial inventory on the batch or serial number, we would be able to see the actual cost of the batch or serial number assigned to the issue transaction at the time of posting, giving us near or real-time visibility into our actual costs. When we have the requirement for this kind of visibility, it is important to ensure our business processes can support the recording of batch and serial information as part of our business processes for product receipt and shipment. <laughs> I'm going to hand it back over to Rachel now to wrap us up with recommendations and resources. Thanks, Anne. Now that we've reviewed all the basics, let's recap the do's and don'ts. Normally, we try to keep them all in one slide, but for space, we split them into two slides today. Let us first review the do's. The first do we have is to run the inventory close and adjustment process at least once per period. Remember that the closing process not only makes settlements and adjustments, but also prevents the backdating of transactions. You'll also wanna make sure that you consider your costing method and your dimension groups um, prior to go live and creating transactions. Making changes to those costing uh, methodologies or to your dimension groups after transactions exist can be complicated um, and costly. We also recommend that you talk with your accountant if you plan to change your inventory costing model, keeping in mind that there can be tax implications. Uh, you'll also want to make sure that you're reconciling your inventory subledger to the ledger once per period, and we'll talk more about that process in detail in part five of our Tech Talk series. You'll want to make sure that you only use the financial value checkbox on the dimension groups um, for batch and serial numbers, if actuals are needed by batch or serial number. We also recommend that you do allow financial negative inventory, unless there are specific business reasons uh, to prevent negative financial inventory. And for the don'ts, we have a number of things that we've compiled together. Make sure that you do not make changes to item groups, item model groups, or dimensions groups after transactions exist. You should always use a testing process, and although we didn't discuss item groups in this tech talk, it's important to know that they impact the GL and the, the costing that will be posted um, to your general ledger and can hinder your ability to reconcile the general ledger to the subledger. Uh, we don't recommend that you use fixed price as a replacement for standard costing. We also don't recommend that you include physical value if there's often a large variance between the receipt and invoice prices. And we don't recommend that you enable financial inventory on unnecessary dimensions. But again, keep in mind, you should be uh, evaluating this very closely and carefully with your customers um, before you go live. Uh, to prevent the need to make any changes. We also don't recommend that you allow physical negative inventory unless there is a specific business case or reason to do so. We've compiled a few additional resources that you can use to help on your costing journey. 
Here we have a link to the Docs cost management homepage. Do please note that we have published a number of updated and new pages and will continue to publish new and updated content throughout the series. You can also connect with the product team by joining the Yammer group, and we encourage you to submit your ideas out on the Ideas site. If you have not already taken the time to complete our survey about additional costing topics, please consider doing so at this time. We have curated a list of possible additional topics that may interest the community and will consider adding to our series for upcoming Tech Talks. You can take the survey at aka.ms forward slash D365 costing Tech Talks. We'll also paste this into the chat as well. And now, Hopefully you remember our riddle from the beginning. And what kind of bedding does an accountant have? I don't know, Rachel. What kind of bedding? Balance sheets. <laughs> uh, quite a few of you got the answer correct in the chat. So thank you for engaging with us and humoring us with our terrible puns about costing. We hope that you'll join us for all of the next Tech Talks where we will feature a new pun in each or new riddle in each one. And so with that, we are going to open it up for questions. We've got a number of questions that have been submitted in the chat, so we will go down the list and try to answer as many as we can with the uh, about 10 minutes we have remaining. All right, Rachel. Our first question, I think, is looking for some clarification from our from the beginning of the session. Doesn't cost of goods purchased equal inventory? Great question. The typically, yes. Um, the account in your balance sheet, uh, the asset accounts, typically is what they are. Are the inventory accounts where you would record your cost of goods purchased? Obviously, that is not true of a not stock product where you would expense it. And that's why we've been kind of generic in this case by saying cost of goods purchased because inventory does represent your physical inventory on your balance sheet while um, it's expensed for not stock products typically. Great. I'll take this next one. The question was, can the RMA credit be done prior to the RMA receipt? So that's a good question, and it's certainly one that our customers who do take return orders um, ask. There are a number of ways to configure the RMA process in D365, and if your process includes issuing um, an upfront credit to the customer, that is something that can be accommodated, although it's it's not always done in the um it's not the same as posting the financial update to a transaction prior to the physical update. So um, we can we can definitely add that to the list of things that people are interested in and come back around and give some more detail on that question. All right, Rachel, let's uh, toss you another one. We have another question that says, is, is there now a way to allocate freight and custom charges to transfer orders or is it still not out of the box? I do believe, Anne, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we do actually support miscellaneous charges on transfer orders. So you can allocate freight or whatever type duties, et cetera, to a transfer order. Um, uh, that feature, I do believe, is behind a feature management key. So if you haven't enabled that feature, you may not see that. It does require some additional configuration as well. Okay. The next question is, Will the inventory valuation report be covered where there is positive inventory quantity with negative financial balances? So I think that when they say, will it be covered by, they mean by our tech talk. Great question. Um, we do plan to dive into the uh, inventory valuation report in much more detail in part five of our tech talk series in part uh, two, I believe in, and correct me if I'm wrong, we will also be talking about what causes um, zero dollar values and um, what can cause um, expansion, like uh, price explosions um, as well, that can cause some kind of unusual scenarios that you might find in the inventory valuation report. So be sure to, to tune in for those. That's correct. Okay. 
The next question is, can you track financial inventory at the location level? Yes, you certainly can. The checkbox is there. You can track financial inventory on any dimensions, um, including all the way down to batch and serial number. Um, however, Ray, you'll want to carefully consider if that makes sense for your business case and your use case. If you're trying to get actuals costing, um, it's oftentimes better to look at using a batch or serial number with the financial inventory uh value rather than locations. If you are tracking financial inventory at a location level, make sure that you have really diligent warehouse processes around operations. Um, and you know, when you're counting inventory, you really need to be uh, diligent about the location being accurate and any kind of movement of that information because moving the location of an item in your inventory can then obviously affect the cost of the item. Uh, in my experience, that's not usually uh, the case, but obviously there could be um, exceptions to that rule based on your business needs. So Rachel, I actually just did a, a real quick test in a demo environment, and we are not able to enable financial inventory on the location level. So the... that has changed with D365 then. So thank you for testing that and validating. Yeah. That is, I think it's a really good time to point out that um, it's always important to test our assumptions in the system, especially when we're trying to make sure we actually understand how costing works. So um, we do this all the time and we're at Microsoft. So it's certainly a practice that we encourage for our customers and partners as well. If you actually have a requirement to track inventory at the low, uh, financial inventory at the location level, I would be really curious to hear the reasoning behind that. Um, for sure, the customer scenario that that uh, tells us we, we might need that. Oh. Next question, when enabled at the warehouse level, is it possible to set up planned cost at the warehouse level for the item? So I think when we're, the question is, when we are enabled financial inventory at the warehouse level? Can we have a planned cost at the warehouse level for the item? Great question. And I assume when you say planned cost that we're referring to a costing version. Um, costing versions do not support a warehouse. Um, they only support a site. Um, however, you can, um, if you're not using standard cost and you're using like purchase, uh, like a FIFO or LIFO or something like that, you can create trade agreements um, at a warehouse level, as long as you mark, there's another checkbox on the form called use for purchase prices and use for sales prices, respectively, then you would be allowed to set up trade agreements. But keep in mind that a purchase price um, is not necessarily um, the same as a cost price, although that is what we default to. And that's how we calculate um, the running average and what we use for like a FIFO settlement. So it depends on your costing method. It's kind of a complex question. If that does not answer your um, question, please feel free to um, to put another one in and we'll try to get it answered. Thanks, Rachel. The next question is another good one. It's asking, is there any problem with marking the stocked checkbox in the item model group for service items to have inventory transactions for them as a reference? And I'll, I'll take this one. The answer is no, there's no problem. This is actually a very common um, scenario, especially when you think about subcontracting in manufacturing processes. In D365, we use service items to uh, track the subcontracting service that needs to be done by a vendor. And if that is not marked as a stocked product, on the item model group, we can't add it to the bomb and we can't then include it in the total cost. So um, it's not a problem to mark stock items uh, for service items. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add to that is just keep in mind if you're marking a service item as stocked, um, you're you're likely, depending on if it's like an, an outsourced service or um, a service that you're selling, um, you might be drawing your inventory negative on that item, or you might be always adding to inventory, depending on like which side of the business you're using it on. 
So you need to think through like, how are you going to remove that? Um, and, and that might be an example of if you don't have a plan to remove it, that you're always going to, um, you know, remove um, the, like the, your inventory is going to go negative, right? So you, you might actually mark the allow physical negative. Um, but keep in mind your costing method that you choose on that item will affect how it's costed as well. Good point. The last question is, are charges in transfer orders a new feature? So I think, yeah, go ahead. I think Rachel, it's probably worth for us to see if we can add that as a, as a, maybe an indirect cost note when we talk about that in a later tech talk, so we can expand on that feature a little bit more. Um, Definitely. It is a, it is a fairly new feature, and like I said, I'm 99% sure it's behind a feature management flag, so you'd have to go into the feature management workspace and enable it. Um, I do believe that there's some docs articles as well um, that you can use to kind of get started on that, um, but yeah. And then just one final piece that I wanted to say um, for for our friend who asked the question about financial inventory at locations not being allowed and who did provide us some information, I want to remember remind that we have the idea site for any um, any requirements that come up that are gaps in the solution. They can be logged as ideas and voted on, and ideas with enough votes can get um, the attention of the product group and help get priority for these gaps to be filled. We can also post in that Yammer group that Rachel showed for cost and account, cost management and accounting to ask our questions around maybe why has that gone away or talk more about who else has seen the same kind of scenarios with customer requirements. Excellent. So with that, I think we're going to hand it back over to AJ to wrap us up and uh, do the survey today. I will post the uh, survey link as well, that aka.ms. Uh, forward slash D365 Tech Talk in the chat for you. So you can fill out that survey and tell us what additional topics you want to see on our Tech Talk series. Thank you so much. Uh, I, as as uh, she mentioned, I've posted a short link to a survey and the Q&A panel. We'd like your feedback on today's session. And uh, we'd like to hear what you like to see in future events. We thank you for any participation. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on Tech Talk's Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and the audience for joining us today. And this concludes today's event.